Amen. Thank you, choir. Those of you who uh, spent some time with us during our People Called Methodist class, either in person or online, I probably um, remember me talking about this, this briefly, but um, in, in seminary, when I was in, in training to, to do what I do, we had to go through church history classes. We had to take two of them, church history one and church history two. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in this, but by and large, I, hi- history doesn't tend to captivate me a whole lot. And so, you know, like talking about like 12th century monks just isn't really my cup of tea. Um, and so, but we, ha- we have to do it. You basically have church history one that takes you up until medieval times from the beginning of the church all the way, and then church history two takes you from medieval times up into today. It's a lot of ground to cover in, in two classes. Um, but history is not my thing at all. And so the way that I went to school, though, is that I went to school year-round. I never took a full-time load, but I went to school year-round. So rather than just having a spring and fall semester, I would have a fall semester, um, and then I would take what's called a J-term class, and then go to school in the spring, and then in the summer as well. And a J-term class meant that you would take a class, but only over the course of the month of January. And so we would go to class for one week, we would get all of our classroom time, all of our lectures from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. for one whole week, Monday through Friday, and that's how we did it. We had pre-work we had to do and post-work we had to do. It was all the same expectations of sort of a three-and-a-half-month-long class, but jam-packed into one week. And so when I was, you know, 20, what, I was 22 years old, do you know what my ears heard? Is that I could either hear church history lectures for three-and-a-half months, or I could hear them for one week. Which one of those do you think that I chose? You bet. I took church history one and two as J-term classes where we just get it over with in one week and I can move on with my life. And so that's what I chose to do because I don't, I don't always find history super captivating. But do you know when I do find history very captivating? When it's told like a story. We find storytelling extremely captivating, don't we? If, if you give me a piece of history that I would never care about in a million years, but you place it in the form of a well-told story, a well-told documentary, a very, very well-put-together book, you can probably make me care about and enjoy just about anything. See, storytelling is always better than history, because storytelling makes us feel like we're a part of what's happening. We can connect with it in ways that just learning about history don't do a lot of good for us. Storytelling lets us see where we fit into all of this. Storytelling lets us connect emotionally to the things that we're learning, and not simply learning dates, facts, figures, people. Stories. Stories are where it's at. And stories are what we connect with more than just facts and figures. So think about it like this. The famous quote from Winston Churchill says, if we don't learn from our history, we're doomed to repeat it, right? But he doesn't say if we don't learn about our history. He says if we learn from our history. There's a big difference between those two, isn't there? To learn about something and then to learn from something are two very different situations. And so he's right. We have to learn from our history, and I think the way that we learn from our history is to actually connect with the history and not simply understand it as dates on a page or pictures in a book. And I'll tell you what, what this looked like for me, an example in my life that I, that I think I, I've told us, uh, this story before in, in some, some form or fashion in this church. When I, when I was appointed to this church a couple of years ago, um, one of the things that I learned along the way was sort of the legacy of pastors that had served this church that had led us to, to where we are, which is all well and good. We all understand that that's the way that this works. But then when I'm reading the list of pastors who had served here all the way from the very beginning up until today, there was a name on this list that stopped me, and that name was Brent Musto, who served here in the 1980s. See, Brent was a very close friend of my dad's. And, and Brent's son, Adam, is a very close friend of mine and, and a very, very close mentor of mine as well in, in faith and, and in the ministry. And so when I learned about this, it stopped me in, I, in my tracks to be like, whoa, this is crazy to think way back when the same place that I stand up and speak, that I stand up and read, is the same place that 
Pastor Brent was, and that he carried his faith tradition on to his son that impacted me to this day. And upon my ordination, when I uh, was ordained, Adam, Brent's son, gave me a book of worship that Brent owned and would have had when he was here pastoring at this church. Extremely impactful. See, this is history. See, but to me, the other names who pastor, I understand they're part of the legacy, but they're just the history, right? But with Brent's name, it was a story. And it was a legacy that touched me and that impacted me. And it kind of, in a really kind of intimidating way, makes me think, what is my name on this page going to be someday? And the truth is the same for all of us, whether it's a name of the pastor of a church or whether it's a name on an ancestry sheet that says that you were the great, great, great grandfather or grandmother or whomever you are of so-and-so. Our legacies are what we leave behind. It's the only thing that we leave behind. And so the question is, is what kind of legacy is it that we're leaving? Because we all have one. And that's what we celebrate today on, on All Saints Day. That's why we practice this tradition, is because we recognize that we are only here in the place that we are because of the people and the saints who have gone before us. This church is only where it is and what it is, in part, at very least, because of the leadership of Pastor Brent and his family. And so our families, our friends, the people that we interact with, our coworkers, are where they are or will end up where they end up, in part, because of who we are and the legacy that we leave behind. And so we remember and celebrate the legacies of others today. The saints that have gone before, but the good news about today is that we do more than just remember their legacies. It's deeper than that. It's better than that. We remember with hope the lives and the legacies that they've left behind, the way that they've shaped us and molded us. But we also recognize that because of the way that they loved us and shaped us and molded us, that it leaves us with a little bit of a hole in our hearts. But that hole doesn't exist there without hope because we don't just celebrate the saints and the legacy they left behind, and that's the end of it. We celebrate with hope the resurrection and the life because of Jesus Christ. It's a lasting legacy in this life and in the life to come that we now join them in ministry together in this life and the life to come. And in the book of Revelation, the Apostle John gets a vision of this idea from God. It's a vision, it's like a dreamlike state that he talks about, and we're going to read about it in Revelation chapter 7. We'll look at verses 9 through 10 first, and then skip down to 13 through 17. The Apostle John writes this about the vision that he saw. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So John sees a vision of people from all languages, all tribes, all cultures, all people, all together, more than he could possibly count, singing and praising God together in one place. Let's keep going. So he sees this vision of this great multitude. And then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? And I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to the springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes." So who are these people? Who is the great multitude? Who are these people wearing white robes declaring the praises of God and declaring that salvation belongs to God and to God alone? 
Well, the response is, well, these are the people who have gone through the great tribulation. And much has been said and will be said about what the great tribulation is and what exactly that means and whether we're post-trib or pre-trib and all these fun and amazing things. The reality of the situation is, is when we pay attention to the passage, great tribulation means an ordeal or a suffering or an oppression. What is the type of oppression that they mentioned has gone away? Pain, suffering, crying, tears. These are the people who have gone through the suffering of life and have made it to the other side. They have made it through the great tribulation that is this life that causes suffering and pain. And they're in an uncountable number of people of every nation, of every tribe, of every tongue. Friends, this is heaven that we see the Apostle John looking at. And in fact, this is often where we get some of our images of heaven, right? White robes, and then eventually we threw in some halos for fun, and then we threw in some wings and all the good stuff. We get that imagery from here. Can't you see them sitting on the clouds in their white robes singing? It's bright lights. We get that imagery from here. But the truth is that this is just a vision from the Apostle John. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is literal, but the truth behind what's happening still remains. This is what God is trying to tell John. Not necessarily exactly what it's going to look like, but what it is. And what it is is a great number, larger than you can count, of people who have made it through the great tribulation of life, and now praise God all together in one voice, shouting with their palm branches, can you hear the shouts of loud Hosanna? For salvation belongs to God and to God alone. Heaven is filled with these people. Heaven is filled with people that you probably would be shocked to find out are there, the Apostle John says. But one of the ways that we can know that this is visionary language and not necessarily to be interpreted literally is how John says that they ended up in this place. How did they end up here? Well, it says they made it through the great tribulation, they suffered in life, and now they made it to the other side. But hopefully the stories are about more than that, isn't it? The story should be more than survival. This whole life that we live should be about more than just making it through. Although the suffering of life and the pains and afflictions of life, survival is admirable when we suffer, isn't it? But shouldn't we long and hope for more than that? And the Apostle John says that there is more to it than that because the gospel isn't just about survival. It's about something much, much more than that. But these people have made it through the great tribulation of life, and how did they make it through the great tribulation? He says, the Apostle John says that they have washed their robes and made them white by the blood of the Lamb. Have you ever tried to get blood out of your laundry before? It makes for a terrible bleach. It is about the most difficult possible thing to get out of any fabric you could possibly imagine. And yet we get imagery here of these people washing their, remember what color are their robes? They're white, and they're washing them in blood. See, because to you and I, in our culture and in our day and in our time, blood signifies death to us, doesn't it? We're, we're in Halloween time. How many people that come trick-or-treating to your house are going to have some sort of fake blood on their clothes or on their face? To us, blood represents death. But the reality to the Hebrew people is that blood meant life. Can you think about that? No blood, no life. And so blood meant life to them. And so the Apostle John says, the, what are these people putting all over their clothes? And all over their robes, what are they adorning themselves with? They're adorning themselves with the lifeblood of Jesus Christ. They cover their robes with the life of Jesus. And they literally put it on themselves that they are wearing, that they are inside of the life of Jesus. They put on the life of Jesus. So these people did not merely survive. They truly live by putting on the blood of Jesus, by putting on the sacrifice of Jesus. 
Because blood means life. They sacrificed that they might live. They sacrificed that others might live. They put on, they washed their clothes, they did their laundry in the blood of the Lamb, in the blood of Jesus Christ, in the life of Jesus and put it on so that we might see Jesus in them. That we might know how Jesus loved and how Jesus lived and how Jesus served. And in their life, they felt the love of God. They felt the love of others. They praised, they sang, they shouted, they lived, and yet, all of this only in part, And now the Apostle John sees them experiencing it in fullness, radically filled with the love of God like they never have before. They are complete, and they are loved. They now experience this life in fullness like they never have before. But you know, the thing is, as John sees the great multitude— when he describes what the great multitude looks like and who is included in it, he talks about it in the present tense and in the future tense. He sees people, not just those who have already passed away and are now experiencing glory, but he sees people past, present, and future, everyone all together shouting praises of the salvation of God. See, John, as we celebrate the saints, John isn't just remembering the saints who have gone before. But when John sees the great multitude, he sees the saints of the present. He sees the saints of the future doing the same thing. And so as we remember the saints who have gone before, who have put on the life of Jesus, that we might know love, that we might know life. Today, we remember their story. See, these people, these people were our Sunday school teachers. They were our mentors. They were Bible study members. They were choir members. They were worship leaders. They were faithful friends. They were fathers. They were mothers who pointed us to the way of Jesus by washing their robes in the blood of the Lamb. But John doesn't just see them. In the vision, John doesn't just see them. John sees all of the saints for all time worshiping all together. These these people that we celebrate today They've done their laundry. They've done their laundry of this life, covering themselves in the life of Jesus, and now they celebrate. They rest from their labor. They rest from their sacrifice. But they have left us with these robes. And you see, it's our turn to do the laundry. It's our turn to do the laundry. That as we thank them and remember their legacy, and it's because of them that we have the honor to sacrifice our lives, to do this laundry, that people might see Jesus in us, that they might feel the love of Jesus in us. It's because of them that we have such an honor. But it's time for us to do the laundry as well. Hebrews Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. Let us do our laundry with perseverance, the robes marked out before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. 
Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, remembering the saints. As we remember their sacrifice, as we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, let us do our laundry together. Let's join in a prayer for the saints together, and and I, I would love for you to join me in prayer. You can follow along with this prayer along the screen. It's a responsive prayer that we will say together. Loving and generous God, we come to you hungry and thirsty for your word. Satisfy our hunger, quench our thirst, nourish our soul. Teach us to listen and heed all your promises and receive the abundance of your inexhaustible grace. And now with words of hope in our hearts, we again respond to your call to carry the good news of Jesus Christ in all languages, beginning here in our community and our communities across the world. Amen. You know, a major part of what we can remember on this day is the legacy of of the saints of our Methodist Church. It is through their organization and commitment that we exist today. It is through the commitment to justice that many have come to know the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. So as we work together to put on the life of Jesus in such a way that isn't just belief, but it becomes a way of living into love. May we remember that as we give in all ways. And so as we move into a time of sharing our gifts and our offerings, we remember that we are tied to a global effort around the world. That's a great multitude that we're a part of when we're a part of the United Methodist Church. Practical needs are provided for around the world and so much more. And our United Methodist women are continuing this effort in a variety of ways by supporting efforts like the Agape House, which is a a women's shelter. And locally, they're supporting a group of youth who are raising money to go on the mission trip this coming summer as well. And so our special offering today is for that ministry as we remember the saints. You can find that offering in the small baskets in the back. If you would like to contribute to that via check, then just place a memo in um, on that check to let us know that that would be what you would like it to be for, would be for the UMW um, memorial offering for today. That is a legacy. May the legacy of those who have gone before us live on in the generosity of which we live. And there are a variety of other ways that you can support the ministries of the church online by text, by mail, here in person. All of those ways are before you. And so as we prepare to grow in our generosity, I would love for you to pray together with me. God of all generations, as we worship today, we offer our whole selves to you. All that we have and all that we are. Like your saints who have gone before us, we pray that you will help us to be bold in our mission and in our witness. May we who have been given so much give freely ministering in your compassion to the multitudes near and far, so that one day we may stand amid the multitude that gathers at your heavenly throne, having done our laundry in this life. We pray this in the name of our Savior and Redeemer, Christ our Lord. Amen.